A Star with Spiral Arms, presented by Science at NASA. For more than 400 years, astronomers have used telescopes to study the great variety of stars in our galaxy. Millions of distant suns have been cataloged. There are dwarf stars, giant stars, dead stars, exploding stars, binary stars. By now, you might suppose that every kind of star in the Milky Way had been seen. That's why a recent discovery is so surprising. Researchers using the Subaru telescope in Hawaii have found a star with spiral arms. The name of the star is SAO 206462. We'll call it 462 for short. It's a young star more than 400 light years from Earth in the constellation Lupus, the Wolf. 462 attracted attention because it has a circumstellar disk, that is, a broad disk of dust and gas surrounding the star. Researchers strongly suspected that new planets might be coalescing inside the disk, which is about twice as wide as the orbit of Pluto. When they took a closer look at 462, they found not planets, but arms. Astronomers have seen spiral arms before. They're commonly found in pinwheel galaxies where hundreds of millions of stars spiral together around a common core. Finding a clear case of spiral arms around an individual star, however, is surprising the arms might be a sign that planets are forming within the disk. Detailed computer simulations have shown us that the gravitational pull of a planet inside a circumstellar disk can perturb gas and dust, creating spiral arms, says Carol Grady, an astronomer with Eureka Scientific Incorporated, who is based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Now for the first time, we're seeing these dynamical features. Grady revealed the image to colleagues on October 19th at a meeting at Goddard entitled Signposts of Planets. Theoretical models show that a single embedded planet may produce a spiral arm on each side of a disk. The structures around 462, however, do not form a matched pair, suggesting the presence of two unseen worlds, one for each arm. Rady's research is part of a five-year international study of newborn stars and planets, using the giant 8.2-meter Subaru telescope. Operated by the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, Subaru scans the heavens from a perch almost 14,000 feet above sea level at the summit of the Hawaiian volcano, Mauna Kea. From there, it has a crystal clear view of innumerable young stars and their planet-forming disks throughout the Milky Way. What we're finding is that once these systems reach ages of a few million years, that's young for a star, their disks begin to show all kinds of interesting shapes, says John Wisniewski, a collaborator at the University of Washington in Seattle. We've seen rings, divots, gaps, and now spiral features. Many of these structures could be caused by planets moving within the disks. However, it is not an open and shut case. The research team cautions that processes unrelated to planets might give rise to these structures. Until more evidence is collected, or until the planets themselves are detected, they can't be certain. One thing is for sure. The Milky Way is still full of surprises. For more news from our home galaxy and beyond, visit science.nasa.gov. Stellar Extremophiles, presented by Science at NASA. Back in the 1970s, biologists were amazed to discover a form of life they never expected. Tiny microorganisms with ancient DNA were living in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Instead of dissolving in the boiling waters, the microbes were thriving, ringing the springs with vibrant color. Scientists coined the term extremophile, which means extreme loving, to describe the creatures, and the hunt was on for more. Soon, extremophiles were found living in deep Antarctic ice, the cores of nuclear reactors, and other unexpected places biology hasn't been the same since. Could astronomy be on the verge of a similar transformation? Researchers using a NASA space telescope named GALAX have discovered a new kind of extremophile, extreme-loving stars. We're finding stars in extreme galactic environments where star formation isn't supposed to happen, explains GALAX project scientist Susan Neff of the Goddard Space Flight Center. This is a very surprising development. GALAX, which stands for Galaxy Evolution Explorer, is an ultraviolet space telescope with a special ability. It is super sensitive to the kind of UV rays emitted by the youngest stars. 
This means the observatory can detect stars being born at very great distances from Earth, more than halfway across the universe. The observatory was launched in 2003 on a mission to study how galaxies change and evolve as new stars coalesce inside them. Galax accomplished that mission and more. In some Galax images, we see stars forming outside of galaxies in places where we thought the gas density would be too low for starbirth to occur, says Galax team member Don Neal of Caltech. Stars are born when interstellar clouds of gas collapse and contract under the pull of their own gravity. If a cloud gets dense and hot enough as it collapses, nuclear fusion will kick in, and voila, a star is born. The spiral arms of the Milky Way are a Goldilocks zone for this process. Here in the Milky Way, we have plenty of gas. It's a cozy place for stars to form, says Neil. But when Galax looks at other, more distant spiral galaxies, it sees stars forming outside the gassy spiral disk. I was dumbfounded, he said. These stars are truly living on the edge. Spirals aren't the only galaxies with stellar extremophiles. The observatory has also found stars being born in elliptical and irregular galaxies thought to be gas poor, in the gaseous debris of colliding galaxies, in vast comet-like tails that trail behind some fast-moving galaxies, in cold primordial gas clouds, which are small and barely massive enough to hang together. So much for the Goldilocks zone. According to Galax, stellar extremophiles populate just about every nook and cranny of the cosmos, where a wisp of gas can get together to make a new sun. This could be telling us something profound about the star-forming process, says Neff. There could be ways to make stars in extreme environments that we haven't even thought of yet. Will extremophiles transform astronomy as they did biology? It's too soon to say, insist the researchers, but Galax has definitely given them something to think about. For more science news from the edge, visit science.nasa.gov. The Mystery of the Lunar Ionosphere, presented by Science at NASA. How can a world with no air have an ionosphere? Somehow the moon has done it. Lunar researchers have been struggling with this mystery for years, and they may have finally found a solution. But first, what is an ionosphere? Every terrestrial planet with an atmosphere has one. High above the planet's rocky surface, where the atmosphere meets the vacuum of space, ultraviolet rays from the sun break apart atoms of air. This creates a layer of ionized gas, an ionosphere. Here on Earth, the ionosphere has a big impact on communications and navigation. For instance, it reflects radio waves, allowing shortwave radio operators to bounce transmissions over the horizon for long-range communication. The ionosphere also bends and scatters signals from GPS satellites, sometimes causing your GPS tracker to misread your position. The first convincing evidence for an ionosphere around the Moon came in the 1970s from the Soviet probes Luna 19 and 22. Circling the Moon at close range, the orbiter sensed a layer of charged gas tens of kilometers above the lunar surface, containing as many as 1,000 electrons per cubic centimeter, a thousand times more than any theory could explain. The idea of an airless moon having an ionosphere didn't make much sense, but the evidence seemed compelling. In fact, the moon isn't quite as airless as most people think. Small amounts of gas created by radioactive decay seep out of the lunar interior, Meteoroids and the solar wind also blast atoms off the moon's surface. The resulting shroud of gas is so thin, however, that many researchers refuse to call it an atmosphere, preferring instead the term exosphere. The density of the lunar exosphere is about 100 million billion times less than that of air on Earth, not nearly enough to support the kind of ionosphere the lunar probes saw. For 40 years, the Moon's ionosphere remained a mystery until Tim Stubbs of the Goddard Space Flight Center published a solution in 2011. The answer he proposes is moon dust. Stubbs, a 30-something scientist who wasn't even born when the Moon's ionosphere was discovered, read the accounts of Apollo 15 astronauts who reported seeing a strange glow over the Moon's horizon. Many researchers believe the astronauts were seeing dust. The Moon is an extremely dusty place, naturally surrounded by a swarm of particles. Think Pigpen in the Charlie Brown comics. When these floating dust grains catch the light of the rising or setting sun, 
they create a glow along the horizon. Stubbs and colleagues realized that dust could be the key. UV rays from the sun hit the floating grains and ionize them. According to their calculations, this process can produce enough charge, that is, positively charged grains surrounded by negatively charged electrons, to create the moon's ionosphere. An ionosphere made of dust instead of gas is new to planetary science. No one knows how it will behave at different times of night and day, or how it might affect communications and navigation on the moon. With NASA's Artemis probes orbiting the moon now, and the LADEE spacecraft scheduled to launch in 2013 to study the moon's exosphere, more information should be available soon. Updates will be posted at science.nasa.gov.